All right, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. So instead of starting with John 1, 1, we're actually going to start with John 20, and then next week we're going to go to John 1, 1. So because John is so specific in his purpose statement for writing this gospel, I just thought it might be helpful for us to understand where we're going and why we're going there. So trust you have your Bibles. I pray you'll make it a priority to come back tonight and support the seven deacons that are being ordained and be part of this uh, special night. Whatever you have planned can be done at another time. So let's read verse 30 and 31 together. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. So right away, John is acknowledging that he didn't write everything there is to write about Jesus. Verse 31, but what he did write, the pronoun these, but these are written, so chapters one through 20, all that he has written up to this point is written with the intent, underline in your Bible, so that you, individually, collectively, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, so you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and then that by believing that you may have life in his name. I pray, oh God, that you would be glorified with all that we do with the gospel of John, that you, oh Lord God, would bless the next couple years. That as we examine the depths of what the apostle John wrote, that we would seek to know it intimately. And knowing it, we would know you, O Lord, that your church would be just thoroughly edified, that the people of God would be sanctified through the preaching and the teaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So authorship is unequivocally John, the son of Zebedee. He will refer to himself no less than four times as the disciple to whom Jesus loved. In Matthew chapter number four, we get the calling of John. Verse 18 says, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting it into sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them, Immediately they left the boat, their father, and followed him. Really, church, Daniel, we really don't grasp this. If we just are honest and upfront, we don't get this. It's just virtually inconceivable for us to think about leaving mom, dad, industry, occupation, city of origin, and just leaving all of that behind and following Jesus. It's such an incredible example for us. This is important for us to understand because John was an eyewitness from the beginning. He was there with Jesus from the very beginning, and now he's going to write about that. Most people will date the uh, Gospel of John somewhere after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. It's after Matthew, after Mark, after Luke. It's as though John looks at what has been written and says, now I'm going to write my Gospel. And you'll notice it's entirely different from Matthew, Mark, Luke. We'll be able to study Luke on Sunday nights and John on Sunday mornings, and we won't hardly ever intersect because they're so radically different. Probably written after the destruction of the temple, showing that Jesus is the new temple. And then this reference to the Sea of Tiberias also gives us greater confidence that it was written late in the first century. John's gospel is set apart from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John's focus is not the life of Christ as a narrative. 
Instead, we're going to look at this idea of person and work this morning and throughout the gospel. In John's gospel, Jesus is the word. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the one and only son, the son of God, the son of man, the Messiah, the Christ, the king of Israel, the lamb of God, the savior of the world, the prophet, rabbi, all in the gospel of John. I promise you this morning, church, if you will be faithful to Sunday mornings, either in person or digitally for the next couple years, you will grow substantially as a brother in Christ, as a sister in Christ. I promise you this will be incredibly edifying for your walk with the Lord if you will do two things. Number one, read the gospel with me in preparation for the sermon. And number two, diligently pay attention as we are in fact working our way through the gospel of John together as a church. He will, Jesus, refer to himself as Yahweh in flesh. He is the I am of Exodus 3.14. And John is going to prove to you that Jesus is the embodiment of Yahweh. He's gonna make that abundantly clear to us. In John chapter uh, 21, you see here in 30, John chapter 21, he repeats this idea where he says, this is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things, who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now, there were also many other things that Jesus did, and were every one of them written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that were written in there. So again, John is focusing on certain miracles that he wants to show you, acknowledging that he did not write about everything. All right, here's our big word right here. The word believe. Uh, these things are written so that you may believe, believe. Believe is found 98 times in the Gospel of John. 98 times. We only have 21 chapters. All right, 20 goes into 105 times. Uh, folks, almost every chapter is going to be John, John, believe, believe, believe. It's throughout the entire gospel. It is a really big deal. It's interesting to note that this is a verb in the gospel of John. Its origin, the etymology behind this is the, now, uh, is the feminine noun, faith. But he uses that zero times. Not one time does he ever refer to the noun faith for John, believing is always an action. It's an action. It's not a state of being. Do you understand the difference I'm making right there? He is continuously believing. This is an action from his perspective. So John writes from this idea. John 1, 17, he, John the Baptist, came as a witness to bear witness to them about the light that all may believe through him. So from the beginning of John to the end of John, John has one single objective for you this morning, and that's that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have eternal life. I want you to think of it like this. This is a little uh, John gospel only. This is just the gospel of John. And the, the idea is this, that you could walk up, Evan, you could walk up to anybody and say, brother, I want you to read this. Friend, I want you to read this. Sister, I want you to read this. And John's expectation, William, is that if you will pour your life through this, if you will read chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, if you will diligently pour through this, by the end of reading this, you will come to the conclusion that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that you will believe unto your own eternal life. Okay? This is a big deal for us, church. Let me say it differently. We should see young men and women, boys and girls, coming to Christ through the preaching of the Gospel of John for the next two years. You should fully expect that your young person puts their faith in Jesus during our journey. In fact, let me argue it more emphatically. You are negligent if you're not praying towards that end. And my preacher is taking us through a gospel that is to show my son, my daughter, how to believe that Jesus is the Christ. I'm going to be present. We're going to watch either in person or digitally. And simultaneously, I'm going to be praying that Johnny, Bob, Sally, whomever comes to Christ through the study of the gospel of John. That's his intent. So let's define believe. 
We can use the Webster Dictionary definition. This is good. This is helpful. I've said this numerous times. I'll say it again. One of the major failures of the evangelical church of this century is the fact that you, the parishioner, sitting in the pew here, oh, preacher's preaching on salvation again, I'm saved, and you literally turn it off and start thinking about the things to do list for the week. You know why you do that? Because you're saved, and you don't need anything more because you're saved. And that's why we have moms and dads who aren't the spiritual leaders of their family. Because the starting point for being the spiritual leader of your family is being able to take your son or daughter and show them how to be saved. And then if you can't do that, you are totally inadequate. You need to fix this. Well, this sermon and the sermon series in John is designed to equip you to be an evangelist, to equip you to be the spiritual leader of your family, to equip you to be able to show your son, show your daughter how to be saved. What, what, what an indictment on the spiritual condition of the church when we have to call for the evangelist to show us how to be saved. Okay? Every elder, every deacon, every Sunday school teacher, every husband, every wife, every mi- Mimi, every poppy, every papa, every Oma, every Opa ought to be able to show their son, daughter, grandson, granddaughter how to be saved. Somebody say amen. amen. Okay? I want you to imagine for a moment... By the way, how do you like this fish? That thing's scary, isn't it? It's a tiger fish. Praise God, it's in Tanzania, not uh, North Carolina. Amen. It's a bad looking fence. Bill, I wish you had eyesight to see it. It has got teeth that you just can't even imagine. And as I was reading about this fish, the suggestion is that the teeth are so sharp, it's like they've been surgically sharpened. Okay? And they go after humans. Okay? So I want you to imagine for just a moment that in in a set time, the doors of this auditorium are going to swing open. And when they swing open, the auditorium will be flooded with these fish. Water in these fish will flood into this auditorium. Now these fish are known to get birds. They literally leap out of the air and get these birds. But what if I told you about a means of being saved from these fish? What if I told you that there was a mechanism whereby you could be saved from these fish? What if I told you about this massive ladder that you would get on this ladder and because you're on this ladder, have no fear, they can't get to you. You'd be a fool not to get on the ladder. You'd be an idiot not to get on the ladder. I would say to you, are you kidding me? And I'd say it with the greatest degree of love and authenticity. Now, what I want you to imagine for just a moment, stay with me, please, I'm trying to teach you something, is that from the beginning, as in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John has been telling us about this ladder from the very beginning. He has 20 chapters devoted to telling you about the origin of the ladder, the design of the ladder, the manufacturer of the ladder, the steps of the ladder, the fiberglass of the ladder, the the composition of every component of this ladder. He has been trying to show you from the very beginning that this is an incredible ladder. You can count on this. It is structurally sound. It will sustain who you are. You can rely on it. You can lean on it. You can trust in it. This is a dependable ladder right here. He is building an entire narrative for 20 chapters to convince you to get on the ladder. He's saying to you that this ladder is full of grace and truth. This ladder was in the beginning when all things were created and he was the very creator of those things. He's telling you about the soundness and the efficacy and the reliability of this ladder. He is telling you that God had ordained for you to climb the ladder before you were even born. That's what he's telling us about. 
you would be an idiot, a fool, an unbeliever not to get on the ladder when you knew that in just a moment the auditorium was going to be flooded by these tiger fish. How scary is that? How obnoxious is that? Give me the next slide while I look for my clicker. Oh, thank you, sister. Thank you so much for y'all that keep up. So conspicuously present in the gospel of John are two things. The word believe, we've already said that, but this idea of being born again. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John make no reference to being born again, none. Only John. Now, isn't that interesting? Because born again is not something I do. It's what the Holy Spirit does. I don't make myself born again. I didn't make my own self born the first time, and I don't make myself born again. It's all the work of the who? All the work of the Holy Spirit. Yet only those who believe are born again, and only those who are born again believe. Now, you can't reconcile that. Don't try to reconcile it. It's not meant to be reconciled. It's two immutable facts that simply coexist. Believers are born again, and those who are born again believe. And you only find that in the Gospel of John. My point to you is that John understands the balance between divine sovereignty and human responsibility perfectly because he tells you to believe. He says, you get on the ladder, and yet you can't get on the ladder unless you've been born from above. Conspicuously absent in this book is the word faith. All forms of repentance, the word never is mentioned in the Gospel of John, never. Conspicuously absent is ever need to confess or profess. Now, why am I bringing this to your attention? Because we are so prone to identify all the things you need to do to be saved. And it suddenly becomes a laundry list of things necessary to be saved. You gotta do this and this and this and this. And yet John says, believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have eternal life. You picked up a pew, buddy. I mean, I've been, I've been watching for seven years and you've never had a person sit next to you other than your mom. This is kind of remarkable. You're a special person, aren't you? What's your name? Lydia. Lydia. Wow. Wow. Good job, Zach. Wow. Wow. <clears throat> hey, for all you men out there that are wondering for yourself, there's hope, okay? All right. John 6. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has what, church? Now, you can read 46, and you can read 48, and you can read the subsequent verses and the previous verses, and John doesn't add to that and doesn't take away from that. So I got to ask you this morning, if John's content with saying that, why are we adding to what John has written? So these are written that you may believe that Christ, the Jesus, that, that Jesus, who's this Jesus? Well, it's used 256 times in the book. It is a proper masculine noun. It has a Hebrew origin as a word, and it means Yeshua. The Yeshua, Joshua, Yeshua has a etymology or a root word origin, and it's two words, and it's Yahweh saves. Yahweh saves. So Yahweh of the Old Testament, Yahweh, that's your, remember that's your English translation, uppercase L, and then that medium case, uppercase O-R-D, that's how it normally looks in your Bible, that's Yahweh. That's the one true and living God of Israel. Well, in the Old Testament, that's the God that Abraham makes a covenant with, God makes a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, King David, on and on, right? Well, now he's in the flesh. Now he's in the flesh. He's come for one reason, it's to save his people from their sins. Matthew 121, you remember this, Matthew 121, every Christian in the room knows this first. Call him Jesus, don't call him Bob, don't call him Jeff Rob, call him Jesus, why? Because he will save his people from their sins. Not tiger fish, from your sin. Or even more appropriately, John 336, from the wrath of God that's presently abiding on you because you don't believe that Jesus is the Christ. So let's get into the Christ. Because let's face it, that's not emphasized much with evangelism anymore. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. What is meant by the Christ? 
I should know this. What's meant by the Christ? It's used 19 times in 18 verses. Uh, Christ is, the Christ is used 14 times in 13 verses. This is a title. This is a use of all the books in the New Testament, 27 books. <clears throat> and you can see that in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's used in the teens or even less. Mark only uses it seven times. But after the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ, it really increases. For example, in Romans, it's used 66 times. Ephesians, with only six chapters, is used 42 times. This is a big deal in the rest of the New Testament that Jesus is the Christ. If we look at various translations of John 1, the CSB says, he first found his own brother Simon and told him we have found the Messiah. And then we get a footnote that reminds us this is a Hebrew word. This is a Greek word, Christos, and it literally means anointed one. Anointed one. So one must believe that Jesus is the Christ to receive eternal life. So is this something you see being emphasized in evangelism? I would say no. In fact, we do everything we can to mitigate it and minimize it and everything instead of magnifying who Jesus is. How unfortunate. So what is meant by the Christ? What is meant by the Christ? So how many would raise your hand and think, I should know this. I, Pastor Sean, I should know this. How many would raise their hand and say, I should know this? That's right. We all should. Imagine saying that basketball is your favorite sport and you have no idea what a foul is. You have no idea what they play with. Is it a puck or is it a, you know, what is it exactly? We, we might not conclude that you really know anything about basketball. Would we agree with that, church? And yet we're so content on being ignorant on what Jesus means, what the Christ means, what the Son of God means, what the applications are. How is it that we've allowed ourselves to be content with knowing nothing? So let's say this, this is hard and this is not. So we are not saying a person must understand the complexity of Jesus being the Messiah before they are saved. We're not saying that. We're not saying that your boys have to understand the depth of the idea of the anointed one for the Old Testament before they get saved. We're not saying that. But what we are saying is that as you teach them that, they will embrace it. They will grow they will understand it greater degree. They won't reject it. They'll understand yes and more and more of it. So let's unpack it. It is an adjective. Once again, we want to look at the etymology of it or the root word behind it. And the ver it's a verb and it means to anoint. It's literally smear. It's literally smear. Tonight, I thought that it would be appropriate to get the picture to smear oil on the deacons. Not like nasty, not like fun, not like a practical joke. In a way of symbolically communicating the idea that you gentlemen are being set apart. Because anyone that was anointed in the Old Testament was set apart by Yahweh for a particular purpose. So now all of a sudden we've been anointing and anointing and anointing and anointing. And then there's a promise in Daniel 9 about an anointed one coming. And then Jesus says, it's me. I am that anointed one. So what does Messiah, where does Messiah come from? So again, the word Messiah is a transliteration. Okay, you say, well, I see a little bit over there, M-A-S-A-H. Well, let's move it to the noun and then you can see it even better. See it right there, M-A-S-I-H. See it there? So anoint is the verb, anointed is the noun. And that's our word Messiah, Hebrew Messiah. Christos is the Greek transliteration of Messiah. And we see it throughout the Old Testament. For example, Exodus 28, Aaron's anointed as a priest. 1 Samuel 10, Saul as a prince. 1 Samuel 15, Saul as a king. 1 Samuel 26, Yahweh's anointed. 1 Kings 1, King Solomon is anointed. 1 Kings 19, anoints to be a prophet. 1 Chronicles 16, touch not my anointed ones, do no harm to the prophets. Psalm 2, against the Lord and against his anointed. Notice that language right there, Yahweh and Yahweh's anointed. Isaiah 45, Yahweh to his anointed, in this case it's Cyrus, as in Cyrus the Great. 
And then finally, Daniel 9, and I have it on the screen for you. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be, and now we get a time frame. And this is why all the first century Jews were looking for a Messiah because, hold my hands up like here, there they had a promise and they had been counting down the years and they realized we're really getting close. He should be showing up anytime. For example, if I could tell you just by gesture that the governor is going to visit Breen in the month of April. We don't know exactly when, but the month of April. Then every day you would show up with an expectation that this could be the day he shows up because you have a promise he's visiting in the month of April. And so you'd be looking around. Is it this Sunday? No, let's try again next Sunday. And the greater degree that we walk the dog down to the end of the month, what would happen to your expectation, church? It would increase. And that's exactly what was happening in the first century. They were looking for the Messiah. For example, we'll see a little bit in John chapter 4. When the woman says to Jesus, we know that the Messiah is coming and when he comes, he'll make it all right. He'll set it all right. He'll tell us where we should worship. Is it Jerusalem or Samaria? He'll tell us. So the best way for us to organize this idea is to look at the Old Testament works that we saw, prophet, priest, and king, and understand that this is Jesus coming as the ultimate and final prophet, the greatest teacher ever, the ultimate high priest, the mediator between God and man, the savior of the world, the king, the ruler, the Lord, the prince, the boss. And so Jesus becomes all of this in one person, thus the Messiah. So these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Son of God. So now we're all into his deity. We're all into his deities, all God. This is God, and yet he's walking in flesh. What's going on here? Who is this? Well, this is the God-man. This is Yahweh in flesh. He is a human being in every sense, like unto us in every way, shape, or form, yet without sin. He is the Son of God. So when we say Messiah, church, get out a piece of paper, sketch it out, and put down the word person, and put down son of God, son of man, or son of um, human, and then on the other side, prophet, priest, and king, and then unpack that. For example, I could also change this and say teacher, savior, Lord, and that would be the same thing. So what's the expectation? That if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, he will function in your life in these three categories. What do you mean function in my life in these two categories? He's my teacher. Jesus Christ is my teacher. Through the Holy Spirit, he teaches me how to do life. He is my priest. When I sin, I don't go to a Catholic priest. I don't go to Sean Harris. I go to Jesus and I confess my sins to him. He mediates on my behalf. He's my king. He's my Lord. He's my boss. I live for him. I submit to him. When I fail to submit to him, I go back to him as a priest and I seek his guidance. And those three areas communicate how he works in our lives. That's how we know who he is. So let's compare this to Matthew 16 to see if we have a parallel that we want to pay attention to. Let's compare this. So turn over to Matthew 16 in your Bible so that you can underline Peter's confession of faith. <clears throat> and what we're going to find is they are remarkably similar. <clears throat> Now, you will recall that this section of Scripture where Peter confesses Jesus to be who he is is what Christ says is the rock that he will build his ecclesia on and that the gates of Sheol will not prevail against it. Verse 13, now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi in chapter 16 of Matthew, he asked his disciples, said, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Who do they say that I am? Who do they say Jesus of Nazareth is? Son of Man is what Jesus is one of his favorite ways of referring to himself in the third person. And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others Jeremiah, and are one of the prophets. He said, but who do you say that I am? 
And every person in this auditorium this morning should ask themselves that very question. Who do I say that Jesus is? Who would I say? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the anointed one. You are the one that we have been looking for. The son of the living God. Now, isn't that incredibly similar to what we just read? It's virtually the same confession of faith. You agree with me that it's virtually the same confession of faith. And Jesus says to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I tell you, you are Peter, and upon this Petros, I will build my church. So what is the truth that Jesus is building his church on? That he is the Christ, the Son of God. We could argue this morning that apart from Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, that this is the single most fundamental truth of the entire Bible. That there's nothing more important than identifying that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That this is what determines whether you're in orthodoxy or not in orthodoxy. This is what determines whether you're a heretic or whether you're in the Christian faith. Now, we can have other dis disagreements over baptism, tongues, et cetera, et cetera, but we can have no disagreement over this very idea right here. Either Jesus is the Christ or he's not the Christ. Either he is the Son of God or he's not the Son of God. Now, this is fundamental to who we are. I can fellowship with a Presbyterian chaplain or Episcopalian chapter, et cetera, et cetera, if they will agree that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We can then, with that as our foundation, move forward. But if you don't have an agreement on that, then I will treat you as an infidel, as an unbeliever, as someone who I need to evangelize, as someone who I need to share the gospel with. That's how fundamental this point is. That's how important this is. So now I need you to go back to this idea of believing. And these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, isn't that interesting, by believing. John doesn't, he's not content with letting us have a moment in which we get on the ladder. That's not, he's not content with that. He doesn't ask you, has there ever been a time that you were on the ladder? He doesn't ask, have you ever put a step on the ladder? Did you ever lean on the ladder? Did you ever hang out on the ladder? And then you got off the ladder. He says that you can know that you have life everlasting, eternal life, if you stay on the ladder. And we need to get this right, church. We need to get this right. Far too many evangelicals, far too many people ask questions like, has there ever been a time? I'm not asking you, has there ever been a time that you stepped on the ladder? I'm asking you, are you on the ladder right now? What do you currently believe about Jesus? I don't know what you did at four years old at a summer camp, eight years old at a summer camp. I'm not gonna ask you, has there ever been a time that you asked Jesus in your heart? Those words aren't coming out of my mouth, and the reason they're not coming out of my mouth is I'm only using Bible words. How many feel like our evangelism should be limited to Bible words? How many feel like that's a reasonable criteria to say Bible words is pretty much, I'll avoid the comics and I'll stick to the Bible? <laughs> Parents prematurely losing their children, and of course that's a nightmare. And then doing everything they can to find a moment in time in which there was a glimpse of something to try to rest in some help. Church, your hope is not found in a moment of time by your four-year-old. It's found in the fact that a good God does what is good. It's the character and nature of a God is where we find assurance, not in a moment of he said this or she said that or they prayed this. Tell your children to get on the ladder and never get off. That's what he says. Notice, please, if we drill down on this verb here, this word, it's a present active, present and active. That's really helpful. I am presently on the ladder. I am presently believing right now. 
Who's on the ladder? I am. It's active. Me. I'm on the ladder. I'm leaning on Jesus. I'm trusting in Jesus. I'm depending on Jesus. I believe in Jesus. He died for my sins. Right now, sister. Why are you so emphatic about this? Because some reason we're all messed up on this as a church. Tracks, literature, ideas. Do you guys in this, this section feel like that the New Testament should guide how we evangelize? Amen. To believe is to put one's faith, trust with an implication that actions based on that trust may follow. So church, if I said to you, I believe that the ladder will save me, but I never got on the ladder, what would you say to me? You don't believe. You may have an intellectual assent as to the efficacy of the ladder, but your failure to get on it shows you really don't believe in it. You really don't believe in it. So is this too easy? Are we falling prey to easy believism? Shouldn't we add some stuff to it to make it a little bit more robust? I say not. I say that we should limit it to what Scripture says. But I want to make sure you can't. Yes, Mom and Dad, that's really frustrating. I'm right there with you. Can I see in their heart? No. Can I know that they've been born again? No. But I want to know. I'm sorry. The just shall live by faith. By faith. Okay, by faith. So what do we do with words like repent, receive, confess? What about submit? What about surrender? Everything that we do with these words need to revolve around belief. Everything. What do you mean by that? All right, let's take the word repent. The only thing I must repent of to be saved is that which is keeping me from believing in the name of Jesus. Do I have to give up my nicotine addiction before I can get saved? Do I have to give up my nicotine addiction? I need to repent. How about all my sins? Let me just repent of all my sins, right? Let's get started on that right now. How many want to join me in repenting of all your sins right now? Skip lunch, <laughs> right? Because we're not breaking if we're repenting of all our sins. Then what is the sin that I must repent of? Unbelief. Unbelief. So if I told you I'm going to get on the ladder and I'm walking this way, what would you say to me? Yeah, turn around, which is exactly what the word repent means. So you could yell out at me right now, what? Repent. Repent. And then once I started going to the ladder, would you keep yelling repent to me? Why? Because I'm on the path to where? To the ladder. Now, this is helpful language because sometimes the biblical author uses repent and sometimes they don't. Acts chapter 16, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But he didn't say repent. You know why he didn't say repent? Because he asked the question, what do I need to do to believe? What do I need to do to be saved? Wait a minute, Acts chapter two, Peter says repent. Why in the world did he tell them repent? And then Paul in 16 didn't because they had just crucified the Messiah. Okay, if you tear down the ladder, before you can believe in it, you need to build it back up. You gotta turn. You gotta turn in your perception of it. They just crucified the Messiah. So let's wrap it up with, you may have life in his name, in his name. What in the world do we have in this name part right there? In his name. And, and, and John loves this references to in his name. He's very fond of it. John 1, 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And then in verse 31 of chapter 20, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So what does he mean by in his name? Those of you who know your 10 commandments know that the third commandment is not to misuse the name of the Lord. Don't take it in vain. So name is a really big deal. Like what's your name? And he says, my name is Yahweh. Name is a really big deal. For example, Acts chapter 4, 
This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other, what? Name given under heaven, whereby we must be saved. So what do we mean by this idea of name? I wanna give you an illustration. This is a uh, Tylenol gel tablet right here, is what this is right here. I've got some right here. Comes in this little bottle right here. And what I want to suggest to you, church, and I'm giving you another illustration. And by the way, parents, if you're not paying attention to these illustrations, shame on you. Because you're a parent, and now it's time to show your children how to be saved. And you say something like, remember when Pastor Sean used the ladder? And then you grab that illustration and unpack it from a biblical perspective. Or do you remember when Pastor Sean held up that little tiny pill? Illustrations are very helpful. Illustrations are very helpful. We need to remember them and use them. So what do you mean by this illustration? I think that his name, his name is a way of encapsulating the totality of the person and work of Christ in four letters, name. All right, what do you mean? All right, I hold up this little Tylenol caplet right here, and it's got blue, white, and red, and that's just a coloring, and there's an outer casing right here. But what is it, what is it that actually impacts my headache or my pain? Is it the caplet, the outside, or is it the chemicals inside? Which is it, church? It's what's inside, right? So what I want to suggest to you, what I want to suggest to you is that it's the person and work that's inside. It's the person and work that's inside. It's the person and work that's inside. So, so let's, let's unpack this. The efficacy of the capul, capsule is directly linked to what's inside. So if you mess with anything inside this, is it the same? I take scissors and I cut this in half and I dump the contents and then I swallow the red and the, and the blue pad. Will it accomplish the same thing? No. Likewise, if you dump anything out of the name of Jesus, dump his deity out, dump his humanity out, dump his priestly office out, dump his role as king out. You dump anything out of the caplet, you're losing the efficacy of what? The caplet. I'm trying to explain to you right now, when we say believe in his name, we're saying everything that goes underneath name. Like you could do an outline, for example, Roman numeral one is name. Letter A is person, point number one is deity, point number two is humanity, letter B is work, number one is priest, number two is prophet or prophet, priest, and king. Nod your head if you're getting what I'm saying here. You understand what I mean? So once you start removing stuff out of the name, the caplet doesn't do what it's intended to do. You gotta swallow the whole thing. Now wait a minute, we're back to the same illustration. If you came up to me and said, man, I have a screaming headache. I mean, my head is pounding. And I said to you, Gene, what I've found is that these Tylenol rapid release caplets are exceptionally effective. They'll work very quickly. And you open your hand. Would you help me out, brother, here? And I open my hand and I dump a little two in there. And then I give him a bottle of water and he never swallows the pills. Would you say he believes? No. This is why John wants us to use a verb, not a noun, because of the action of what? Believing. Believing. You can pray a prayer all day long concerning the Tylenol, and you can think about how effective the Tylenol are and how they all, but that won't save you, okay? You can believe with your whole heart on those Tylenol right now, but you've got to actually go like that. By the way, I have a screaming head, so I'm going to take advantage of this. And you gotta swallow the capsules. Have you swallowed the capsules this morning? Have you climbed the ladder? Are you trusting in Christ? Are you there? Does he operate in your life in the idea of prophet, priest, and king? Does he speak to you? Is he your savior? Is he your boss? Is he your Lord? How many of you feel like this morning I'm a little bit better equipped to share the gospel with somebody else this morning? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you for your grace and your goodness. And I pray, oh Lord God, that you would use us in the city of Fayetteville, salt and light. And God, if there's even one young person here, some young man, young woman, 
middle-aged, it doesn't matter who, that's unsaved. I pray, oh God, today would be the day they get on the ladder. In Jesus' name, amen.